So this is the pre-lab lecture for the first experiment. The first experiment is pretty straightforward. We're not doing a lot of proper chemistry here. This is more just basic lab techniques followed by a little bit of statistics and recording data and things like that. So I'm going to spend most of this pre-lab lecture kind of going over the stats and everything else behind doing this experiment. You guys can read through the experiment handout now. Pretty straightforward. You guys are doing three basic things in this experiment. You're measuring a rod using a ruler. You're taking the temperature of the classroom. And then you're weighing a penny in three different ways. So the actual experiment itself isn't too difficult. The stats can be a little much to handle if you're not used to it, so that's why I'm going to spend my time going over it. So in chemistry and science, we collect lots of data, and it's important we know what to do with that data. So for example, if we had taken the temperature of the lab room and we got a bunch of different results, let's say we got 22.2, 22.3, 22.4, Three, twenty-two point six, twenty-two point seven, and twenty-two point eight. And of course, these are in degrees Celsius. So in chemistry, we use two units of temperatures, degrees Celsius and Kelvin. So most times when we're talking temperatures in chemistry, they're going to be in degrees C. And for those of you who don't know, the scale for degrees C, zero is the freezing point of water, 100 is the boiling point of water, average human body temperature is 37 degrees. So let's say I had this set of data. One thing we could do with this is find the average. Now, most people usually know how to calculate averages, mainly because of grades. Grades are usually done in averages. So for an average, and we see average in statistics represented by x with a little bar over it, it's just going to be the sum of all these values divided by the number of values. So in this case, if I add everything up, we would get 100. 12.6 and we would divide this all by the amount of entries so in this case it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and if we do the math on that we get an average of 20 2.5 Five. So, an average, pretty straightforward, and obviously this is still degrees C. Very important to keep track of units. Um, something to really, really keep track of in all sciences, but especially chemistry. Now that we have the average, the other thing that we can calculate is variance. So you guys are going to see all these statistical terms kind of flow into each other. The scary formula for variance is V equals the sum. So anytime you guys see this symbol, that's just the symbol in mathematics for sum of. It just means we're going to take a value and add a bunch of them together. So variance is equal to the sum of the average. So remember I said average we represent as x bar minus x i so x i in this case is each individual value we're going to take that whole thing and square it and then this is going to be divided by not the entire set but the entire set minus one so we represent that as n minus one so like i said that's kind of the scary form of the formula what this really means is we take each individual value we subtract it from the average, we square it, we add all those variances up together, and then divide by the set minus one. 
So what that would look like is basically if we look at the set we have, so we just calculated the average at 22.5. So what this would actually be is just 22.5 minus each one of these. So if we did that for each set of these, squared the difference and then added the results, divide that by n over one, that would give us our variance. So if you actually do the math on this, your variance in this case would equal 0 0.067. Now the last statistical term we have to look at is standard deviation. And thankfully, remember I said all these stats terms kind of flow into each other. Standard deviation has a relationship with variance. So the standard deviation of a set is equal to plus or minus the square root of the variance. So if we're calculating it out this way, we can just simply take this number here and plug it in here because that's the variance. So in this case, with our numbers s would equal plus minus 0 0.26 and I should mention too your standard deviation is going to be plus minus this and it's going to be that unit so in this case it would be degrees c our variance is actually going to be degrees c squared so these are the base statistical things that we're doing with the data sets we're going to be generating in this lab. The last thing we're going to go over is the Q-test. Now the Q-test is a statistical method for allowing us to know if we are able to reject data. I jokingly refer to it as the way we can use statistics to lie to a data set. So this data set here wouldn't be the best for a Q-test just because most of the values are near each other. So a Q-test is going to help you identify outliers and statistically say that these are outliers and we shouldn't count them while calculating our average or standard deviation or other values that we could see. So what we're going to do is we have to calculate something that's called Q-calc. And all Q-calc is is the absolute value of the number we suspect to be the outlier minus its nearest neighbor, I'm just going to write NN for nearest neighbor, divided by the range. And for those of you who don't remember, range is the difference between your greatest and your least numbers in a set. So in the set we did the stats on originally, the range would just be 22.8 minus 22.2. Like I said, this data set here doesn't really work for QCalc because what we do after this is plug the numbers in, we get a QCalc, and then we compare it to a Q table. This table is available to you guys. It's going to be in your post lab, I believe. And then we have to compare the two values. So if QCalc exceeds the tabled Q value for the number in the experiment, the suspected value may be rejected. That sounds kind of difficult to understand, but basically all it means is if QCalc exceeds the number in the Q table for that certain value, you can reject the value you're questioning. So the example I'm going to use here, I'm going to add a ridiculous outlier in this case. Let's say we had the same set as we had before, but we also had a value that was 25.2. So you guys can see just by looking at that and say, oh yeah, that's probably an outlier, probably a mistake. Some kind of error was made during the taking of that measurement. But you can't just reject it. You can't just throw away data willy-nilly. Willy you have to have a reason for it. So doing a Q test, you can tell if that value can be rejected. So in this case, we would do the Q test. So we got to do Q calc now. So this is going to be the absolute value of 25 0.2 because that's the value I suspect minus its nearest neighbor so you would list these ordered from least to greatest I kind of stuck it up front because I was running out of room but technically it should be down there so its nearest neighbor is that 22.8 so minus 
22.8 absolute value divided by the range. So now my range would be 25.2 minus 22.2. So when we do that, we get a Qcalc that is equal to 0 0.8. So now the next step is we have to compare it to the table. If we look at our table, we have, in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six values. So Q table is equal to, for a set of six, is equal to 0 0.56. So in this case, my Q calc is greater than my Q table which lets me know I can reject that value, which means that this 25.2 was an outlier. Now, if you guys look at the formula for this, you can kind of see if you have values that repeat, their nearest neighbors are going to be themselves. So out the outlier and the nearest neighbor are going to cancel each other out. It's going to be the same number subtracted from itself, which is going to be 0, it's going to make the top of this equation zero, which means the overall Qcalc will be zero, which means you won't be able to reject that, va that value there. Now, this is the longhand way of doing it. I'm going to tell you guys right now, it's the only experiment I ever want you guys to do this longhanded, and I'm going to show you why right now. So the reason I said this is the last experiment I want you guys to do this out by hand on is because Excel is a very useful tool for doing collection of data and then using statistics on that data and stuff like that. Excel is also just a very powerful tool in general. It's something more people should realize is this powerful. I personally have most of my common lab formulas in an Excel sheet that make it easy enough that I just have to enter a couple numbers and it calculates everything out for me. So I'll kind of show you guys the quicker way to do this. You guys see here we have our same value we had before with our different values for temperature. So the quick way of doing this is if we just do the formulas that are programmed in Excel. So anytime we hit equal in Excel, it's gonna start a formula. So there's some formulas that are baked into Excel. So if I go equals av, it'll bring up average. We highlight the group we want and that will give us our average. It's not gonna give you the right significant figures. Excel loves to spit out as many decimal places as it can. You have to go in and limit that yourself. And then again, the quicker way we, we can do this, if we want to cap, so this is our, I forget. This is our av. We'll do there, and this will be a standard deviation. So our variance, we type var. So var is the formula for variance. They'll spit your variance out. And then standard deviation. I want this without the P in it. And then we highlight our data set again. And there's our standard deviation. So that's the super quick way of doing it. If you have to show a little more work, you can do it. And Excel does make it easier. Just takes a couple extra steps. So I'll show you how you go through that now. Same way we kind of work through it on paper just using excel to make our data neat so the first thing we got to do is calculate our squared difference between these guys so what we're going to do is we're going to set this equal and now this is where we can put our own formulas in so remember that first part of the equation for the variance it's going to be our average minus the individual value and we're going to want that squared so i got to keep these in parentheses very important to use parentheses when you're in Excel because much like your calculator, it's just going to kind of take what you type into it without having the parentheses in there. It'll do some wacky things. So that's going to give us our first variance, our squared variance. So now normally you hit control down, works. You guys can see here, this isn't going to work. And that's because when you control down, if we look here, it's gonna go down each individual one. So now this blue that is not reading our average anymore, it's reading our variance. So we don't want to do that. We want that value to stay on average. 
So we have to fix our formula a bit. So if we go back to this, if you put cash signs in front of the A in front of the nine, that's going to tell Excel to lock that value in place. So if we do that and then hit control down, what you guys are going to see here is while this is going to move down, this will stay here. So that's going to calculate our squared variance or this, our square difference in our variance there. So now that we have that, we can sum that up. And now you can do this in two ways. You can sit here and go equals this plus this plus this, etc. Or if you don't want to sit there on a big data set, you can hit sum. Gives you the sum function, highlight all these, and boom, that's the sum of our square difference. If we take this, and now divide, remember variance is this, divided by our set minus one, so five minus one is four. That gives us our variance, and thankfully they equal the same thing. Longhand, it's the same amount of steps as this last one, but to do standard deviation now, we hit equals, standard deviation, we hit equals, we hit type square, that's gonna give us a square root, that, and that gives us a square root. Again, they equal each other, which means we did our math right. So on small data sets like this, it does save a little time. The bigger the data set gets, the more reliant on Excel you can be. So it's a really useful tool. The more you can learn how to use different formulas in Excel and get comfortable in Excel, the better it's gonna be for the stats. And you can also use it on your post lab to kind of check your work to make sure you're getting the right answer along the way. So like I said at the beginning of the experiment, this week is fairly easy. You guys can look over the handout. Like I said, you're doing three simple things. You are taking the temperature of the lab. The best piece of advice I can give for that one is just make sure you're not holding the thermometer down where the alcohol in the thermometer is because then you're not taking the temperature of the lab, you're taking the, your own body temperature. The second part, you're measuring the length of a rod and that should be fairly straightforward. You guys are gonna measure that in centimeters. Last thing you're gonna do is there's gonna be a bounce in your hood and you're gonna weigh a penny in three different ways. You're gonna weigh it directly, you're gonna weigh it by difference. So you're gonna take the mass of the beaker, you're gonna put the penny in there, you're gonna take the mass of the beaker and the penny, and then you're gonna subtract between the two, that'll give you the mass of the penny by itself. And the last way you're gonna do it is you're gonna put do it by tearing the bounce. You're gonna put the beaker on the scale, you're gonna hit tear, it's gonna zero out the bounce, you're gonna put the penny in, and you get the value for that. Ideally, they should all be pretty equal and near each other when you do it. Other than that, that's basically it. The other thing is what you guys are going to notice when we're up in lab and taking measurements is everything we measure with has a certain accuracy to it, and that's measured by the units that it's divided into. So the thermometers, for example, are divided into whole degrees. You guys are going to make a reading one decimal place beyond that unit. So thermometer is going to be in whole degrees. You guys are going to measure to a tenth of a degree, estimating that last tenth of a degree. That's kind of how we take measured units in lab. Same thing with the ruler, except the ruler is going to be tenths of a centimeter, also known as a millimeter, because metric's great. So you guys are going to take measurements to a hundredth of a centimeter, estimating that last unit. Other than that, that's basically it for the pre-lab lecture, like I said, it's a very simple lab itself. The hardest part of this experiment is the statistics for the post-lab.